much. It's a great honour to be invited to give uh, the F.D. Morris Lectures. I'd like to thank Professor Woodhead for that invitation and also I'd like to thank you for attending. This is how I've structured my part of this uh, lecture. So first of all, introduction, oaths. In this annual series of lectures, we commemorate the theologian John Frederick Denison Morris, who was born in 1805 and lived through three British coronations, George IV in 1821, William IV in 1831, and Victoria's in 1838, before his appointment to a chair at KCL in 1840. It was an important transitional period in coronation history, for the exorbitant cost of Prinny's lavish inauguration, famous also as the one in which the estranged Queen Caroline was refused entry to Westminster Abbey, was sufficient to bring the curtain down on many practices of great antiquity, to the extent that that of William IV was comparatively modest, while Victoria's ceremony was so beset by mishaps that coronations ever since have been micromanaged, the participants forced to endure multiple rehearsals. Unfortunately, our honorand appears not to have, been, uh, have commented on any of the 19th century coronations. His focus, to paraphrase William Norris of this department, whose doctoral thesis on Morris has lately been approved, was upon Christ's kingdom, rather than upon the kingdom of those three Hanoverian occupants of the British throne. However, our theme today is the British coronation oath, and Morris was certainly alive in a time of growing sensitivity to oaths in general. In 1834, when he was 29 years old, six men from Tolpuddle in Dorset were convicted of illegally swearing an oath. Why? The previous year, in the face of declining wages, some agricultural workers from that village had formed a society aligned with the Grand National Consolidated Trades Union. Unaware of the law, they had devised an initiation ceremony that included the administration of an oath. The government heard what was afoot, sent informers to infiltrate the society, and had its leading lights arrested. Their trial turned upon the taking of that oath. I quote Albert Pionke, a recent historian of Victorian oath-taking. The Tolpuddle defendants could have been charged under the Unlawful Societies Act of 1799, which made it a misdemeanour to belong to an unlawful combination, defined as any association in which members took an oath not required by law. But the 1799 Act had been weakened by the Seditious Meetings Act of 1817 and the legalisation of trade unions in 1824-25. As a result... The prosecution tried the defendants under the much more severe Unlawful Oaths Act of 1797, originally written to prevent mutiny aboard Navy vessels during the war with post-revolutionary France, which made it a felony to administer an unlawful oath, punishable by a maximum penalty of seven years' transportation. With the help of a judge hostile to trade unionism and a jury carefully selected for the, the occasion, the Tolpuddle men were convicted and given the maximum sentence allowed under the 1797 Act. From our perspective, all that seems bizarre. The past really was a foreign country. How may the repression be explained? Looking at the matter narrowly, oaths that had been laid down in the English Reformation or during the turmoil of the 17th century were designed to prevent or limit educational, legal and political opportunities for non-Protestants. Religious discrimination began to dissolve in the 19th century. Yet, as Sir Robert Inglis indicated in an 1834 House of Commons debate about denominationally specific oaths required of Roman Catholics in consequence of the 1829 Catholic Relief Act, they had a deeper purpose. He held that, quote, without oaths, without a solemn appeal to God, there could be no stability or security for any system of society. Soon after the re-establishment of the Roman Catholic hierarchy in England in 1850, Cardinal Wiseman issued a famous pastoral letter known informally by the title Out of the Flaminian Gate. That publication gave rise in 1851 to an anonymous essay in Blackwood's Edinburgh magazine, which made the case for oaths even more emphatically. I quote, The sacredness of oaths to the is essential to the existence of society. The man who is not to be believed on his oath is self-banished self-disfranchised, self-excluded from all the rights of society, for the obvious reason that, if all men were equally false, society must dissolve. Such a man is no longer entitled to the protection of law. As Pionke sees it, such statements present oath-taking as 
the conduit through which individuals, their society, and the divine unite in a sacred, unbreakable system. True, those, those sentiments were not, in fact, new. We find Lord Bristol opining in 1647 that oaths are, quote, the highest and strongest obligation that can pass from man to God, from nation to nation, from subjects to their prince, or prince to their subjects, or from man to man. And this is not only so declared in scripture, but was undoubtedly part of that natural and moral law which was by God planted in the hearts of man even from the creation. Now, if oaths are a good thing of heavenly institution, then you may be wondering, why did the Tolpuddle martyrs fall into jeopardy? The answer is this, because only the right kind of people were to be permitted to swear them. For, argues Pionke, oath-taking was a rite of passage to membership of the upper professionalised ranks in the public sphere. The oaths sworn, for instance, by nascent doctors, attorneys, sergeants at law and MPs, simultaneously express and confirm their swearer's elite status by calling upon the divine to witness and invest that status with sacred authority. In that context, it was essential to avoid proliferation. Overexposure, Pionki insists, could make oaths and the sacred social elite who swore them banal. The non-elite invention of oaths, as by penurious Dorset farm workers, threatened to undermine Britain's carefully cultivated gradations of civic power. Streamlining, streamlining indeed, was the order of the day. The 1868 Promissory Oaths Act replaced several historic oaths by simplified and ecumenical but still theistic versions restricted their use and prescribed the swearing of oaths by many categories of person. Nevertheless, provision was made for non-theistic affirmations. While the statute contains a, a list of exempted oaths, the coronation oath goes unmentioned. And yet, had Morris been an assiduous reader of the popular press, he could hardly have failed to notice how often the coronation oath was invoked. Let me give one example. In February 1839, Lord John Russell, for the Whig government, introduced into the House of Commons a scheme designed dramatically to increase state control over the education of English working class children. The church's centuries old monopoly of education had already been broken in 1833 by the introduction of grants, and that policy required schools believed to be deserving of state aid to be recommended either by the National Society, which was Anglican, or by the British and Foreign School Society, which was nonconformist. It was the aggressiveness of the National Society in seeking to revert to the status quo ante, and incidentally, King's College London featured prominently in the Society's plans, that in large part pushed the Whigs into proposing their Erastian scheme for a secular, or at least more liberal and less bigoted, public educational framework. But what the government had in mind was controversial. It won a division in the Commons on 24th June 1839 by only two votes. That outcome unleashed a torrent of Anglican vituperation. Six days later, the newspaper The Age reprinted the coronation oath, its admitted excuse being the anniversary of the coronation on 28th June, and observed pointedly that the words are English, quote, and by English Protestants easily understood. By reproducing what is described as the fearful oath, it was hoped, the journalist declared impertinently, that the Queen might, at the end of the first year of experience, stand before her people as one who has diligently, faithfully and piously endeavoured to perform its demands. That statement is subtly elusive. Vagueness, though, was abandoned a couple of pages further on. The Archbishop of Canterbury, the age reported authoritatively, intended in the Lords to move an address to the Queen praying her not to sanction the appropriation of the unpopular grant that has been carried in the lower house of parliament by a popish majority of two. We trust that Her Majesty, it went on, will give ear to those who, in guarding the interests of this Protestant country, best guard the integrity of her Protestant throne. Let her remember the cause of the House of Brunswick being placed upon that throne. Let her remember the coronation oath which she took when she became seated thereon. The newspaper contended that unless the government's plan was thwarted, every fraction of the £30,000 at stake would go towards, quote, propagating doctrines in disseminating principles subversive of England's altar, destructive of England's crown. 
Reaching his peroration, the writer exclaimed, Woe be to England the day when indifference to creed has entered her palaces, and charity to the Jesuit sits in her Senate house. Rabid anti-Catholicism resurfaced in the newspaper John Bull in September 1839. Queen Victoria has sworn in the face of her people, it shrieked, to oppose and prevent any unconstitutional advancement of popery. With all the sovereign power and authority with which, as defender of the faith, Her Majesty was on the day of her coronation invested. Now there is an interesting idea. The idea that the coronation amounts to the moment when the sovereign's sovereignty is, as it were, switched on. Even more striking is the argument propounded by the Bishop of Exeter in his visitation charge that autumn. Should members of the government's proposed supervisory committee be indifferent to their duty as Christians to make the knowledge of true religion the foundation of public education, he claimed, they would find the same duty enforced by considerations of another kind. For they are the sworn counsellors of the Queen, trusted with administering the funds granted to the Crown for the purposes of public education. They are bound, therefore, to make the religion of their sovereign, that religion which not only the conviction of her heart, but also her contract with her people, her coronation oath, binds Her Majesty to maintain to the utmost of her power. As her sworn counsellors, they are bound, I say to make this religion, that is, the religion of the Church of England, to be the foundation of the system of national education. We've discovered then that Morris's era was one in which oath-taking was tightly controlled in order to preserve the social hierarchy, that the non-elite swearing of illegal oaths could be punished harshly, and that topping the constitution was an oath, the coronation oath, which some saw as a contract between sovereign and people. The takeaway message from this lecture is twofold. Firstly, that Bishop Philpotts of Exeter belonged to a venerable tradition of so regarding the coronation oath, a tradition whose inception long antedated the emergence of a Protestant Church of England. And secondly, that the commentators forming that tradition were entirely correct to interpret it in that way. By enunciating the core values which the nation holds dear, the coronation oath sets out the conditions for kingship, queenship, and thereby establishes monarchical accountability on earth. So where does the coronation oath feature in the service? It's necessary to recall that the English monarchy was elective before primogeniture became the norm. Uh, One vestige of the Anglo-Saxon practice of choosing the king from within the ruling family survived in the secular enthronisation ceremony, which in the Middle Ages preceded the coronation. In that preliminary ritual, the sovereign was elected by the magnates and placed in the ancient marble throne, the king's bench, in Westminster Hall. He was invested with a sceptre from his personal set of regalia as symbol of taking possession of the realm. Few witnessed those events. The monarch then processed into Westminster Abbey, illustrated here. Another vestige of the elective tradition, but more prominent because more public, is when the officiant, usually of course the Archbishop of Canterbury, introduces the candidate for coronation. That's what's shown here. Standing with the candidate in the coronation theatre, the officiant faces in turn each of the four directions and asks the same question, whether or not the congregation recognises the candidate's entitlement to be crowned. On each side, those present acclaim the person as their monarch, crying, God save the king or queen. Of course, only members of the elite could hear and respond, yet the repetition in each direction was obviously intended to address those beyond the walls too, and for whom the congregants are representatives. David Cressy, the the historian, contests the acclamation's importance on the grounds that the respondents are in other respects unrepresentative and unlikely to reject the candidate, as if there was any choice in the matter, he says. Nevertheless, it is vital to what follows that they are asked at all. Had there been no real function, then this element of the right would have vanished long ago. Having been recognised by acclamation, the candidate must proclaim a commitment to his or her side of the bargain. The terms of the bargain, or contract, or covenant, are expressed in the coronation oath. To be accurate, coronation oath is something of a misnomer. What we are discussing is a series of promises in question and answer form, rounded off by the the oath. The remainder of my section of this lecture will show how the history of those promises contributed significantly to giving us parliamentary sovereignty, uh, the sovereignty that we enjoy today. Now, I want to move on to section three, a troublesome favourite and a tricky tense. 
The earliest coronation oath, the Anglo-Saxon promissio regis, was declaratory. The king promised three things. Firstly, that the church and all Christian people within his dominion preserve true peace. Secondly, that he forbids all unrighteous things. And thirdly, that he commands justice and mercy in all judgments. The same text is thought to have been used for the Norman and Angevin kings up to and including Edward I. But it was drastically revised in 1308 for Edward II's coronation. The revision occurred for two reasons. One reason, looking backwards, was the magnate's dismay at his father's repudiation of his confirmation of the charters. And the other, looking forwards, was their alarm at the growing influence, considered malign, of his low-born favourite, Piers Gaveston. The upshot was the addition of a fourth clause. In translation, the whole oath now went thus. That's only a clause four, but I'm going to give you all four. Sire, are you willing to grant and preserve and by your oath confirm to the people of England the laws and customs granted by, to them by former kings, your godly predecessors, and particularly the laws, customs and liberties granted to the clergy and the people by the glorious king St. Edward, your predecessor? And the response is, I grant and promise them. Sire, will you for God and Holy Church and for the clergy and for the people keep peace and accord to God to the best of your ability intact? Response, I will. Sire... Will you in all your judgments have impartial and proper justice and discretion done in compassion and truth to the best of your ability? Response, I will. And now number four. Sire, do you agree to maintain and preserve the laws and rightful customs which the community of your realm shall have chosen? And will you defend and enforce them to the honour of God to the best of your ability? Response, I agree and promise. Edward II's coronation oath has spawned a huge scholarly literature. Most attention has been paid to the novel fourth clause. The least controversial part is the community of the realm. Although historians struggle to know what the author meant, the phrase was soon interpreted to mean Parliament. The main point at issue, however, is whether or not the clause relates to future laws and customs. In other words, debate centres on the correct tense in translating aura es lieu, in the French version, or elegerit in the Latin version. It's difficult to know when exactly this dispute erupted, but it may have been in 1642, and as a byproduct of literary exchange in 1641, which had made fleeting reference to another clause. That debate probably awakened others to the broader importance of the coronation oath. Consequently, the House of Commons, whose relationship with the king, Charles I, Uh, had been deteriorating for two years, was swift to instigate inquiries over the content when it heard that Charles I, who had withdrawn to York, had refused assent to a bill for the levying of 10,000 men for service in Ireland. The refusal was conveyed under a royal letter of 13th May 1642, intended for recitation in both Houses of Parliament. It reached them on the 16th of May. Immediately, MPs established a committee whose remit, apart from scrutinising the oath, included looking up a statute of 1351 from Edward III's reign and investigating whether or not former kings, in rejecting bills, had used a formula other than, other than le roi s'avisera. Peers that same day set up their own committee to seek precedence. Lords and Commons had soon resolved to publish a joint declaration that would address the king's asseverations and conduct. And so it was that that declaration emerged from the press in May 1642 as a remonstrance. Here it is. The tract is important because it seemingly inaugurated discussion of the meaning of the 1308 Oath's fourth clause. On that topic, the authors said that it was fitting, and I quote them, to declare unto the kingdom what is the privilege of the great council of parliament and what is the obligation that lieth upon the kings of this realm to pass such bills as are offered unto them by both Houses of Parliament, in the name and for the good of the whole kingdom, whereunto they stand engaged, both in conscience and in justice, to give their royal assent. In conscience, in respect of the oath that is, or ought to be, taken by kings at their coronation, as well to confirm by their royal assent such good laws as their people shall choose, and to remedy by law such inconveniences as the kingdom may suffer as to keep and protect the laws already in being. 
Supporting this statement is a rehearsal of clauses two to four of the Latin coronation oath and part of the preamble to the 1351 Statute of Provisors of Benefices. The latter act was especially useful because two of the oaths clauses are invoked. In the petitionary part of the act, subjects asserted that upon complaint of mischief being done to the realm, the king, quote, is bound by his oath with the accord of his people in his parliament, thereof to make remedy and law. The reference is to clause, clause four then. But the purpose of the legislation was largely to compensate for the fact that an earlier statute had not been enforced. In that context, so the preamble explains, Edward III had recognised that he was bounden by his oath to cause the same, the act, passed in his grandfather's time to be kept as the law of the realm. Hence the king was drawing attention to his responsibilities under Clause 1. Our parliamentarians of 1642 glossed this shift by remarking that the king had decided to fix his answer upon another branch of his oath and pretermits, i.e. passes over, that which is claimed by the Lords and Commons, which he would not have done if it might have been accepted against. What they did not say was that notwithstanding Edward III's interpretation about the operative bit of his coronation oath, this statute of 1351 did amount to new law and therefore had come into existence under the obligation enunciated in Clause 4. At any rate, Edward III's tacit acceptance of the petitioner's assertion was taken to prove the fundamental significance of that promise. The remonstrance continues from where it had left off for those quotations. In justice, it's, it says, kings are obliged to give the royal assent in respect of the trust reposed in them, which is to preserve the kingdom just as much by the making of new laws as by the observance of old ones. The question was how far they were obliged to follow Parliament's judgment touching what the new laws should be. I quote, and certainly, besides the words in the king's oath referring unto such laws as the people shall choose, as in such things which concern the public weal, they, MPs, are the most proper judges who are sent from the whole kingdom for that very purpose. So we do not find that since laws have been passed by way of bills, that ever the kings of this realm did deny them otherwise than is expressed in that usual answer, le roi servisera which signifies rather a suspension than a refusal of the royal assent. Parliament, then, was committed to translating elegorit as shall choose. Clause 4 concerned future legislation. Charles I disagreed. From the royalist camp, there appeared an answer, which reminded readers of the divine right of kings and protested that the alleged obligation to grant the royal assent had hitherto been unknown. Charles is represented as admitting that, lacking sufficient acquaintance with records, he was unsure about the oath's history and could not tell whether or not Parliament had quoted the text accurately. But he insisted that the arguments advanced in the remonstrance were incapable of deduction from what had been disclosed. The king had two main objections. First, that elegorit can mean hath chosen as well as will choose that the former translation applied here, he maintained, was indicated by the reference to customs. People do not choose customs, and kings are not sworn to defend them. Second, he asked a rhetorical question. Could it be imagined that he would be bound to approve such laws, the Militia Bill, for example, that would divest him of his power, and particularly the power to perform what is described as the great business of the oath, namely, to protect the people? In order to counter the parliamentary case, Charles printed, quote, the oath itself we took at our coronation, warranted and enjoined to it by the custom and directions of our predecessors and the ceremony of their and our taking it. He meant that the surrounding rubrics were included in the ensuing quotation, which was ostensibly derived from exchequer records. The intention behind this introduction was presumably to foster the idea that the oath of 1626 had been hallowed by antiquity. And it's true that Charles quoted his own oath accurately. The problem, however, was twofold. This version did not go further back than 1603, and it fails to translate elegorit. The fourth clause simply requested the king to keep the laws and customs that the commonalty of the kingdom have. Obviously, the meaning was thereby utterly changed. Moving away from the concept of popular participation in the passing of future legislation and towards the notion of the monarchical observance of existing laws. 
As for the preamble to 25 Edward III, Statute 4, the king did not deny that he was bound to remedy by creating law the mischiefs affecting the realm, but sought to evade the implications of that duty by posing yet another rhetorical question. Did the preamble also require the ruler to renounce his judgment? The formula loa sabizara, he added, if it be no denial, is no consent. This public ping-pong of contradictory views quickly drew supporters on each side. Henry Parker, probable author of an anonymous treatise available by early July 1642, opined that the king's dignity was erected to preserve the commonalty and that the old coronation oath confirmed all laws and customs amongst which we most highly esteem parliamentary privileges. It did not much matter, he said, whether Elegerit was translated in the past tense or in the future tense because the king is bound to consent to new laws if they be necessary as well as defend old, for both being of the same necessity, the public trust must needs equally extend to both. And we conceive it one parliamentary right and custom that nothing necessary ought to be denied. Parker was answered in November 1642 by a royalist work attributed to Dudley Diggs, who was more circumspect. There was, he said, as much difference between the tenses as between democracy and monarchy. For him, customs could not refer to the future. And while he agreed that the king was bound to consent to new laws if they were necessary, he is not bound to believe all necessary, which is pretended to be so. Interestingly, the election is held to have been made by the people diffusively rather than by any representative body, and therefore of much other authority. Yet no denial of Parliament's age-old right was intended. Diggs insisted legislation would neither be abrogated nor enacted without popular assent. But, he ins insisted, there is a mean between doing nothing and all. Early that month, uh, November 1642, Parliament issued another remonstrance, powerfully elaborating its original arguments. The true sense of elegerit remained central. Regarding that portion of the coronation oath which mentions the king's strengthening such laws as the people have chosen or shall choose, the matter is not great whether way it be rendered, it, they, they said, so it be always understood that the laws refer in that clause to the royal assent as a thing future and not past. Extracted from a memorandum on Richard II's coronation, the relevant Latin words are quoted, ending with quas vulgus elegerit. The authors translated that phrase as which the people should choose, explaining that that expression clearly relates to new laws that should be chosen by the people, and in all the alterations in the form of the oath that we can find, excepting that which was taken by his majesty and his father king james wherein the word choose is wholly left out that clause is understood of new laws to be made and for verification they quoted the french oath of edward ii and edward iii the latin oath of henry iv and uh, various other texts if the fourth clause did not speak of laws forthcoming then it was hard to grasp the meaning of the word corroborandas in the latin version the infinitive of which corroborare, quote, signifies to give strength to a thing. For what strength could laws that had passed the king and both houses receive more than they had before? Or to what purpose should those words, quas vulgus elegerit, be put in, but to puzzle the whole sense, if it, had been, if it had been meant only of keeping the laws? And therefore, in the oath which is set down in English, in that answer to our declaration, the word chosen is quite left out, as altogether superfluous, as indeed it would be if it had no relation to such laws as were to be presented to his majesty by his people. Those writing the November remonstrance underlined that they were, had not formally stated that the prince was obliged to pass all bills. What had been said was that the ancient coronation oath committed English kings to assent to all bills offered by both houses in the name and for the good of the whole kingdom. The distinction being drawn here was between public bills, which could not be refused, and private bills, which might. There was nothing new, the authors said, about this requirement under the fourth clause, and they paraphrased an entry on the Parliament roll of Richard II, where the king is noted as announcing that, despite clerical protest, he would not forbear to pass a certain bill because of his coronation oath. He was obliged for to do it. Parliamentari parliamentarians had sought in vain for any precedent of sovereigns routinely denying public bills. And when such a bill had not been allowed, kings had invariably given the traditional response, le roi s'avisera, which, if it be not a consent, it is not a denial. Moreover, the November remonstrance delivered the coup de grace. In that, readers can have been left in no doubt that the first two Stuart kings of England had sworn a defective oath. 
Referring to the May Remonstrance, the authors explained that the reason they had not used an English text was because they simply couldn't find one, even though they believed, on the basis of the Archbishop of Canterbury's memorials, that Charles I and his father had indeed sworn an English oath. What they had found there was the Latin oath consonant with the text already quoted from elsewhere and the French oath agreeing with that, the French version itself being consistent with other French sources dating from the reigns of Edward II and Edward III. From this research, they concluded that the coronation oath had been the same in Latin and French for centuries, but that the English form used by James I and Charles I could not be attested before their own times. And now comes the critical passage. It had never been their aim, the parliamentarians avouched, merely to give the text of the oath that had been sworn by the present king, Charles I, Rather, their purpose had been to cite the oath that anciently was and of right ought to be taken by the kings of this realm, which oath we do not conceive had in, any had power to alter without an act of parliament. Consequently, they would not have been driven to reproduce the Latin text if they had succeeded in locating the English one upon record and the English being but a translation out of the Latin and the French. We should not stand in need of much Latin or French, they said, to find this form of the oath set down in that answer, and which is said to have been taken by his majesty to be no good translation, and particularly as to the clause of the oath in question, that elegorit does not signify only have and no more. Let me put things starkly. Parliament had discovered uh, correctly that the English coronation oath had been doctored and that James I and Charles I had both sworn the doctored text. Charles I's assertions that his coronation oath was unexceptionably traditional and that it had been registered in the Exchequer were totally exploded. Since no Crown-sponsored account of the last Westminster Abbey coronation had been published, and not even a summary would be available until 1658, many subjects must have been astonished by these claims and counterclaims. Predictably, the oath features in the ensuing pamphleteering, though not all controversialists expanded the meaning of allegorite. The royal chaplain, Dr Henry Fern, for example, was more concerned to argue that, by contrast with elective monarchies, the king was sovereign before his coronation, which meant that the oath could not be conditional. A tract ascribed to Charles Hurl provided a sophisticated rebuttal. For him, uh, far from being an absolute monarchy, England's government was coordinative, and a mixed monarchy comprising the three estates of king and two houses of parliament. Citing the 15th century Lord Chancellor, Sir John Fortescue, approvingly, Hurl maintained that the unwritten fundamental laws of the kingdom were the original frame of this coordinate structure, contrived by the consent of both ruler and people. In other words, there had been a remote moment of first coalition. It was true, the author conceded, that the prince was prince prior to swearing the coronation oath, but he held office only upon trust, like his predecessors, and the law required that that oath be sworn. Consequently, in every reign, the original frame, according to which this incorporated form of government had been constituted, must be confirmed by the mutual oaths of the two parties. The individual who did most to keep this interpretation of, of Elegorit's pivotal was William Prynne. Prynne's premise was that the king was bound by his coronation oath to assent to public bills in the making of which he had had no hand and which he could not alter. These circumstances prove that the prince did not enjoy supreme power. Legislative supremacy really lay in both houses of parliament. But what exactly did this all-important oath say? Alluding to the divergence between monarch and parliament over the rendering of elegorit, Prynne came down firmly on the parliamentary side. The fourth clause, he said, refers to the confirmation of future laws to be afterwards made in Parliament, not to those only in being when the oath was administered. Else kings should not be obliged by their oaths to keep any laws made after their coronation by their own assents, but only their predecessors assented to, which were most absurd. Having repeated all but one of the oaths, uh, text quoted in the November Remonstrance, he turned to the first clause in particular, stressing that it related to laws and customs granted by former kings. A contrast with the fourth clause naturally suggested itself. For if this latter clause should be in the preter tense too, hath chosen, as the king and his mistaken counsel object, it would be a mere surplusage or batology, yea, the same in substance with the first part of the oath, and our kings should be only bound to observe their ancestors' laws, not their own. 
What then was the role of the coronation oath overall? Subscribing to the same myth of the ancient constitution as Fortescue and Hurl, Prynne insisted that there must have been a common will and a common law before there was a monarchy. The people had sworn their kings to observe those laws as a condition of coronation and admission to government. In due course, a further oath had been added, He's, he means the clause four, in order to bind kings to pass such later laws as they should choose, quas vulgus elegerit. The crucial point for Prynne was that taking the historic coronation oath was not optional. It was a legal necessity. Even though men might come to the crown by hereditary succession and were to be accounted kings prior to coronation, their tenures nevertheless depended upon those subsequent conditions in law contained in their coronation oaths. Such conditions imposed no new obligations, but simply amounted to the ratification of old ones, which had been inseparably annexed to the crown by the common law ever since Edward the Confessor's days, if not before. And elsewhere, he clarified that the oath embodied conditions and covenants. Should the king decline to swear it, then he could neither be crowned nor receive his subjects' allegiance. Worse, he would be adjured in the name of God to renounce the regal dignity altogether, it was this capacity lawfully to prescribe the terms upon which kingship must be exercised that made the whole kingdom and parliament paramount. Hence, for Charles I to have rejected a public bill without giving convincing reasons to both lords and commons was, declared Prynne, directly repugnant to his coronation oath, conveniently forgetting the fact that quas vulgus elegerit was in fact missing from the oath that the king had actually sworn. Despite all that strife, amazingly, the same defective coronation oath was used for Charles II in 1661 and for James II in 1685. However, one outcome of the Glorious Revolution, when the oath became statutory, was a new text giving unambiguous expression to the sentiments of the fourth clause of 1308. For the wording shown here carefully encompasses both past and future statutory legislation. The royal assent, I should remind you, was last denied in 1708. Hence those shrill Anglican voices attempting in 1839 to hold Queen Victoria to the coronation oath's religious clause were doing so at the expense of her obligations under another clause. Finally, contract and the problem of diminished majesty. The coronation oath has long been viewed as a contract. The poets John Gower died 1408 and Thomas Hockleave died 1426, refer to it as a covenant. Lord Treasurer Salisbury reportedly said in 1610 that James I had taken an oath to project, protect his subjects and to minister justice to them so that such things are already contracted for in heaven. The late 17th century Whig Anglican divine Samuel Johnson variously described the oath as a fundamental contract or the covenant of the kingdom or simply a downright English bargain. Intervening in the 1839 debate about education then, Bishop Phil Potts of Exeter, as we saw, belonged to this same long tradition. Unsurprisingly, contractarianism tended to rear its head most frequently when the oath was perceived to have been broken. Even before the Glorious Revolution, the accusation of infringement was prominent in proceedings for the removal of three kings, Edward II, Richard II and Charles I. For example, the main theme running through the list of 33 charges against Richard II is the king's faithlessness. Five charges deal with his contravention of the coronation oath. In all three cases, the crux of the problem was the clash between a strong monarchy and an incompetent monarch. Monarchical government had developed earlier and more rapidly here than in most European countries, so that by the beginning of the 14th century, English kings, quote, were the head of a highly centralised legal and policing system, which was the chief peacekeeping agency right down to village level. Indeed, in many respects, the state had become too impressive. As Christine Carpenter of Cambridge explains, the king's power to do harm or good was so great that it simply was not possible to manage without him, as was the case under Stephen in the mid-12th century, or even as late as the early 1270s, during the absence of Edward I on crusade. A deeply fallible or dangerous king, she says, was too dangerous to be endured indefinitely. One common factor linking Edward II, Richard II and Charles I was the problem of what Conrad Russell called diminished majesty. Under the last of those rulers, respect had dissipated to such an extent by 1642 that, as Lord Brooke put it, even some of the king's closest servants had had the courage almost to despite him to his face. While Charles III is hardly a tall man, he does not at this juncture suffer from diminished majesty in the sense meant by Russell. Yet he might come to do so. 
as Dr Gross will reveal, the coronation oath is still of huge importance. Positively, then, the 17th century tangle over the fourth clause of 1308 helped to give us parliamentary sovereignty by, in effect, rendering the royal assent automatic. But, negatively, medieval and early modern English history affords plenty of warnings of what can happen if the idea gets about that the head of state cannot be trusted. Many thanks, David. Uh, that was a fascinating, detailed contextualization of coronation oaths. Uh, and thank you, too, to Professor Woodhead for giving us this opportunity to present the F.D. Morris Lectures. And, of course, thank you to all of you for being here. There's been much constitutional and historical debate on the value, meaning, and nature of the coronation oath in modern times. Robert Hazel and Bob Morris of the Constitution Unit have presented papers setting out potential alternatives or modifications. So too, the likes of Bonnie and Berry have questioned and been concerned with the question of religion in such an oath in a contemporary setting. Most of these, however, have assumed to some degree the need for an oath of some kind within the framework of some kind of ceremony. The questions have therefore centered on alterations for the future and the religious nature of the oath. Yet of late, several wider or broader questions have been asked. Now we're in the context of the reign of a new sovereign and of a forthcoming coronation. Why have a coronation oath at all? Or indeed, a coronation? And how can we understand this ceremony given the concept of the king is dead, long live the king? What is the place of the oath within that framework? In this short paper, I'll be aiming to set out why the oath remains important in a 21st century setting what has changed in more recent history, and how we might view or understand the oath through the prism of contract and of marriage. Writing or talking about the oath has taken on a whole new meaning in the last few months. As David has highlighted, the oath showcases the evolutionary, even revolutionary nature of our constitution. And we now have, just two days ago, the liturgy for the coming coronation. Reinforcing the points already made with contract, this lecture argues that the coronation oath should be seen as akin to a contract and as a development of Magna Carta and of the 1100 Coronation Charter. Rights are old in this country. This is made all the clearer by crucially contextualizing the oath within the rest of the right, which places it according to tradition, as David has set out, after the contractual recognition acclamation and before the sacral consecration stages of anointing and crowning. By 1714, there were two distinct coronation oaths, one for England, later distinguishable as the British oath, and one for Scotland, and a third accession declaration oath altered in 1910 for George V from a denunciation of Roman Catholicism to the monarch swearing to being a faithful Protestant. The development of this tradition, long before and surviving after the Act of Union, rested on those changes that David has set out. As with custom, the Scottish oath is sworn upon accession and has already taken place. The British oath will take place at the coronation in just a few days' time. When one thinks of a coronation, one perhaps immediately thinks of the crowning as the most important element of those complex of events. Whereas, in fact, there are three that are perhaps more important. Arguably, the recognition acclamation, as discussed, the coronation oath, and the anointing. Why? The oath is of immense significance because it's the conditional element with which a monarch must comply if they're to proceed with the rest of the ceremony. It's the crucial follow-up. So here we have a typical order for a coronation. The oath is thus this follow-up to the acclamation and only takes place on the basis of popular consent. It comes at the heart of the service and needs to therefore be seen in contractual terms. No monarch in Westminster Abbey has avoided this requirement. To break with this tradition would be a radical step. To put it another way, to have a coronation without the coronation oath makes little sense within the tradition of British coronations. The two are bound together. 
What was the Queen's Oath? And what has changed in more recent times? Technically, any form of the coronation oath which does not match the wording set out in the 1688 Act is contrary to law. In practice, however, several changes have been made without amending the original Act. These changes have generally reflected constitutional territorial developments. The oath, as set out in the Act, referred to the Kingdom of England. So in later oaths, this was changed to Great Britain and then to the United Kingdom. Other alterations took account of the fact that after 1931 and the Statute of Westminster, the King or Queen was separately monarch of various Commonwealth realms, such as Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. In the oath taken by George VI in May 1937, he swore to govern all those realms, which were listed according to their respective laws and customs. Queen Elizabeth II's oath took account of the fact that India and Ireland, both Commonwealth realms in 1937, had become independent republics by May 1953. In 1953, Churchill and Attlee agreed in parliamentary debate for modifications to be made to reflect territorial changes. And this was in turn covered by agreement between the UK and other Commonwealth realms. The coronation oath has therefore constantly evolved to reflect changes to territorial composition. So it will need again to be updated for 2023. There can no longer be references to South Africa, Pakistan, and Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, all now being republics. If, however, modifications went beyond such territorial reference, then this would be a major step, and surprising that legislation would not be required or a much greater discussion in Parliament and more generally. In 1937 and 1953, senior legal advisers to the government argued that most changes were implied amendments which had legal authority from other statutes. Nevertheless, Lord Hailsham, the then Lord Chancellor, said future revisions must be li limited to what was essential to give effect to alterations in the UK or monarch's constitutional position. Most recently, Oliver Dowden, now the Deputy Prime Minister, confirmed that the government intends to follow this approach. He said that no express legislative authority is required to make the changes on the basis that they're to ensure consistency with the position regarding the realms and territories as reflected in legislation. Why then retain this oath in the 21st century? And what will be changed in just a few days' time beyond territory? F.D. Morris spoke of the spirit of judgment as some of the most complex thoughts and words of his life, and yet judgment as the most beautiful in the whole word of God. The coronation oath speaks to that spirit of judgment. It's rooted in the tradition of Solomon. The monarch is the chief judge of the country, the fountain of justice. Our judges are his majesty's judges. In the United Kingdom, the coronation oath in conjunction with that prior recognition and acclamation serves not only to bind consensually the monarch to the people and to the apparatus of government as it is evolved, but also to enunciate some of those principles of law, justice and mercy upon which that governance rests. These principles or rights have been arduously attained and they should be strenuously upheld. This is more than symbolism, not least in our era of extreme turbulence when democracy can seem increasingly fragile and leaders across the world are prepared to break the rule of law and we have war ongoing in Europe. This was brought ever more home to me when doing a recent interview with Ukrainian TV on the oath and the purpose of a coronation in the 21st century, and we were interrupted by an air raid warning. Why, I asked, was a coronation of interest to Ukraine? To which the response came back, it's difficult for you to understand, but what we wouldn't give for a chance to celebrate in such a way or pronounce on our values rather than thinking about war. We are interested because these moments are moments of celebration and we need such light in the darkness. We forget so easily here in the UK just how important the rule of law is in maintaining our way of life and also how such symbolism and such celebration is not available to all but can be a beacon of hope to those in peril around the world. I just want to make sure I get the right one. I want to go back. I want to turn to the religious clause. The religious clause is often seen as the most problematic 
in the more secular world, it is argued, in which we live. The question here is the role of the sovereign as supreme governor of the Church of England, and whether there should still be a state church in the 21st century. The design of this part of the oath is rooted in the changes made to the oath following the reign of James II. We now have the liturgy for the service. For Saturday, the Archbishop of Canterbury has adjusted the words that would normally be said before the oath to reframe the Church of England focus to one of all faiths. It now reads, Your Majesty, the Church established by law, whose settlement you will swear to maintain is committed to the true profession of the gospel, and in so doing will seek to foster an environment in which people of all faiths and beliefs may live freely. The coronation has stood for centuries and is enshrined in law. Are you willing to take the oath? The justification given is explained in two parts. The wording before the oath explains that the Church of England seeks to foster an environment where people of all faiths and beliefs may live freely. In the words of Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, gently and assuredly, the Church of England has created an environment for other faith communities, and indeed people of no faith, to live freely. King Charles III, at a reception at Buckingham Palace, days before his late mother's funeral, drew attention to this same fact. He reflected that his Anglican Christian confession committed him to the common good of freedom for all faith and belief traditions as articulated in this wording. This is then followed up with, and you'll see that the amount of words they are using goes far beyond even the oath itself. The oath is prescribed by the Coronation Oath Act 1688, an act of parliament. An innovation in this service, that's in a few days' time, is that the oath is preceded by a short paragraph in which the Archbishop reflects the church will continue to seek to foster an environment where all people may live freely. This reflects the words of Her Late Majesty in 2012 when she said the concept of our established church is occasionally misunderstood and I believe commonly underappreciated. Its role is not to defend Anglicanism to the exclusion of other religions. Instead, the church has a duty to protect the free practice of all faiths in this country. Given the many words used to justify this innovation, in contrast to the words of the 1953 oath, it seems to do more to highlight the problems of the oath and the need for some alteration, rather than justifying the innovation. The stipulations coming out of the changes for William III and Mary II, and what would follow after Anne's accession, were entirely devised to prevent the inconscious agreement of a Roman Catholic from being able to take the oath or accede to the throne, as grasped in an account by Celia Fiennes, the travel writer in 1702, that the oath is very large in three articles, relating to all privileges of the church and state, to which she promised to be the security and maintenance of all to us. Then she kissed the Bible, then a Bible was presented to her to maintain the true Protestant religion. In 1702, a further addition was made. Queen Anne was to make a statement on what had become arguably the most important theological difference between Roman Catholics and Protestants, the doctrine of transubstantiation. This statement of rejection would not endure as part of the Ordo, and from 1761, it became traditional for the monarch to read the Declaration in the House of Lords, and in 1910, it was altered to become slightly less insensitive to the Roman Catholic subjects of the monarch. Times had changed, and so it appears now. Yet the difficulty, of course, is the absence of an agreed position for something new and the lack of legislative time before a coronation in a new reign and then the absence of parliamentary support for such change during a reign. Time will, of course, tell if this changes. How to view a coronation? Two analogies help. That of the coronation as the acting out of much of the British Constitution and as a contract or covenant between the people, as David has mentioned. And two, that on the death of the previous sovereign and the new reign of the current, there's of course no gap. If that's viewed as the engagement to the state, then the coronation can be seen as the formalization of this or the marriage. Writing on the oath in 1661, Samuel Pepys recorded for the momentous restoration coronation of Charles II, the king in his robes entered bareheaded, which was very fine, and after all had placed themselves, there was a sermon and a service. And then in the choir at the high altar, the king passed through all the ceremonies of the coronation. The crown being put upon his head, a great shout began, and he came forth to the throne. And there passed more ceremonies as taking the oath. 
and three times the king at arms went to the three open places on the scaffold and proclaimed that if anyone could show any reason why Charles Stuart should not be king of England, that now he should come and speak. Pepys's feelings at seeing his sovereign stand out, and moreover the acclamation and rejoicing for the crown monarch, is emphasised, as is his central importance of the oath. What is intriguing... I'm just going to skip that one. What is intriguing is the wedding-like question as to whether or not anyone objects to the king as sovereign. Perhaps Pepys has merged this idea with the acclamation, for the recognition is not put in this way. What can we conclude? Arguably, it underlines the real contractual character that people recognised it, recognised, or at least Pepys did, in a coronation. There was a legitimate sense that those present were consenting to this new monarch. It was not a fait accompli. To add further weight to this contract, the service in which the oath is embedded is similar to a wedding ceremony with vows. The marital analogy is all the more real because a coronation involves a special ring, this one from 1831. And this came to symbolize the indivisibility of the crown from the sovereign, but also the king's marriage to the kingdom. That tradition from medieval times lasted all the way through to 1953 and will be repeated on Saturday. Mary I referred to her coronation as a marriage, her being wedded to the realm and to the laws of the same with the spousal ring. And likewise, this was a contractual relationship that the people had promised their allegiance and obedience to her. And Elizabeth I maintained a similar position, declaring that I am sworn when I was married to the realm not to alter the laws of it. For James I, it was even ordered that the ring shall be set on the king's wedding finger. The convention continued and is expressed in a 17th century manuscript. Receive this ring as a pledge of the marriage that is between the king and the people. The ring is now put on. And remember that as God has made you, our Lord and King, a husband to your people, so it is your majesty's part to love and govern them and to provide for their welfare, as it is theirs to pay you their affection and obedience. The tradition of a coronation ring can be found even earlier in Greek and Egyptian custom. For the Romans, it can be seen in the magistracy, whence, according to Wickham Lake, it passed to the Christian bishops and the Christian king. The royal signet came to symbolize the inseparability of the crown from the king, but also the meaning of the king's marriage to the kingdom. Such an act emulated Episcopal consecration, as we further discussed tomorrow. The essential point is the sacramental idea of the Episcopal marriage was transferred to the king and here assumed constitutional and practical importance. The parallel to the sacrament of marriage did not end there. Although confetti was not thrown over the newly crowned sovereigns, in a form of reversal, commemorative medals were distributed amongst spectators in early modern times. The new status of the monarch was to be minted for all to see. In an age before photography, these medals were a palpable form of enduring publicity. The symbolism was of such transparent importance that it registered with eyewitnesses. Celia Fiennes noted in 1702 for Queen Anne's coronation that the ring is put on her finger to witness she is married to the kingdom. Such a bond being anchored in the popular mind when a sovereign failed to meet those expectations or breach of contract, as has been mentioned in the cases of Edward II, Richard II, Charles I, and James II, then it was to the vows, the coronation oath, to which people returned. Equally telling for the importance of those is the way we view uncrowned, or of course, unsworn sovereigns, as being in part not fully sovereign. The often forgotten Edward V won one of the princes in the Tower reign for just 77 days and was murdered shortly after his deposition. Lady Jane Grey, the nine-day queen, has always been seen as a usurper. Yet had she taken the oath and been crowned, what then would Mary Tudor have done? As it happened, Mary led the only successful coup d'etat of the 16th century. And so we fast forward to the 20th and the abdication crisis. The 16th century French philosopher Jean Baudin neatly summarized a widely held view that an English monarch is not fully incumbent if they've not sworn the coronation oath. In the modern era, the abdication without coronation of Edward VIII, if anything, cemented this theory. Such an idea is encapsulated by Baudin. Kings of England are not consecrated unless they swear to keep the ordinances and customs of the country. The abdication crisis of 1936 was hugely significant for coronations and the coronation oath, reinforcing the idea that an uncrowned and unsworn monarch was not perceived to be fully king or queen. Although Edward VIII swore the Scottish oath immediately upon accession, 
the royal family was relieved that that process of inauguration had not gone further. Reflecting in 1936, the late Queen, on 1936, the late Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, told Sir Eric Anderson, the late Sir Eric Anderson, that fortunately he, Edward VIII, was never crowned. And that was one of the good things he did. If he was going to make up his mind to go away, to do it before. Queen Mother had a, a way with words. The coronation oath is thus of considerable constitutional significance. On the one hand, it's been deployed effectively against delinquent kings. On the other, monarchs who've not undergone one do not seem to be fully sovereign, notwithstanding their legal status. Two transformative moments may be isolated and have occurred, very important in different ways. The swearing of the oath and the anointing. This lecture has been concerned with the former, tomorrow is with the latter. Many other oaths have descended to the present day. Parliamentarians of either house must swear an oath of allegiance to the monarch before they may take their seats. Cabinet ministers are invariably appointed to the Privy Council, which means they're obliged to swear a special oath of 16th century origin, secret until 1964. Judges are required to swear both an oath of allegiance and the judicial oath. Senior members of the judiciary also become Privy Councillors. Those joining the army, the Royal Air Force, the scouts and girl guides must all swear oaths, as must those become becoming police officers. Each of these mentions allegiance or loyalty or service to the sovereign. It would be absurd or incongruous if the sovereign at the summit of that pyramid swore no oath at all, or one so watered down as to become meaningless. To put the matter differently, given our predominantly unwritten constitution and the fact that the monarch is above the law, what links him or her to the constitution? It's the coronation oath. Significantly, countries such as Norway, with a written constitution, require their sovereign upon accession to take an oath, Article 9. And that's similar for the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and Belgium, which all make reference to their constitution. Norway also includes a reference to God, the Almighty, and the Omniscient. This underlines a basic point. Where a written constitution provides for a royal oath, that oath refers to the constitution. There is a harmonious circularity. As we've seen, the coronation oath was not simply akin to a legalistic contract, but was also analogous to a marital vow. It was a sacred bond too. In the order of service, the monarch having publicly made those promises then went to the high altar to seal them by solemn oath proper. Until the 15th century, this appears to have been done by swearing on the gospels. But then there was a shift to swearing on the Eucharistic elements laid out on the altar, which seemed or served to emphasize the sacramental nature of the transaction. Such was this sacral importance that it endures, and for the modern era, the monarch kisses the Gospels and subscribes the oath at the altar, uttering the phrase, the things that I have here promised, I will perform and keep, so help me God. Given this long tradition, and in the 20th century, the trauma of abdication and the absence of oath-taking, questions would certainly arise as to where this would leave any future sovereign who abandoned the oath, or indeed the coronation. Let me conclude. This lecture has highlighted a form of binding constitutional arrangement at the heart of the English and later British monarchy, with those origins dating long before 1649, 1661, or even 1689, as David has set out. The role of the oath following the recognition acclamation are important in reinforcing the constitutional contractual nature of the monarchy within the nation and the country, a point that should resonate all the more in the turbulent political world that is Putin, and even in the cross the pond in US politics. The oath has undergone much development since its medieval origins. On each occasion, it's been at the heart of the coronation ceremony and part of the state's anatomy in the form of a contract-like agreement. Concurrently, the ruler was restrained by the oath's promises, and if they were not, they were reminded of them. Yes, this ceremony is rooted in the medieval past, but traditions take years to build. Here some a thousand years. They can be gone in a second. A ceremony based on such tradition and continuity provides a point of stability in the rapidly changing world in which each new generation lives. A coronation is an opportunity to reflect, to collect our thoughts, to remind ourselves of our priorities, to pause to assess the direction of travel in which as a society we go. It's undoubtedly symbolic. The royal prerogative is unrecognizable from the days of the first Queen Elizabeth. And the relevance of such ceremonial can be questioned, perhaps should be questioned in the modern age. Nevertheless, we must be mindful of the power of symbolism. And so we return to Morris's spirit of judgment.
To have the head of state swear to uphold certain core values such as law, justice and mercy speaks for the entire nation and sends a message to the rest of the globe, a message of what the United Kingdom is about. In 1953, with rationing ongoing and London rebuilding from the Blitz, this was a chance for a new Elizabethan age, as Churchill noted in his eulogy for George VI. Here, the recognition acclamation linked to the oath are reinforcing paramount moments, a reminder of rights hard fought and of the long-standing nature of our democracy. In 2023, this should resonate all the more in the turbulent geopolitical world in which we live with war once again on the European continent. Thank you. <laughs>